won Darlington a few weeks before that in a uh, uh, kind of finished under caution, if I remember right, and Bobby Allison run second, and he wasn't very happy that day. But this race, I remember when you were leading at Talladega or Daytona either one, and Kelly, Yar Car Kelly Yarborough was behind you, you were a setting duck. Uh, I mean, he was notorious for his slingshot move on the last lap. Sometime it worked. It didn't work too good with him and Donnie in 79. But, you know, every now and then it worked pretty well. So I remember leading that race, and David F., you saw a shot of him and Buddy Parrott. They were my crew chiefs. And they were screaming at me, and Robert Yates was in the pits. you got to get in second place. you got to get in. You cannot lead this race on the last lap. I said, what do you want me to do? Hold up my hand and say, hey, I'm going to go back to third if y'all don't mind, and then I'll, I'll run along in there but I, I couldn't I was committed to being in the front and I remember going I said I got to do something you got to do there's got to be the way to win this race from from the front so we went in the first turn and I just dropped I mean straight to the bottom and I'm pretty sure that Donnie Kale uh, and they, I, I, I'm, they probably thought something happened to my car because I dropped so quickly but I dropped down got a huge lead then I come off turn two and I look back and I said uh oh because here they come, and they were drafting on each other, and they come up to me. And it didn't show it real clear in that video, but when Kale started to the outside, I moved up just a little bit, touched his left front fender, and he got loose. And that allowed Donnie to get up beside of Kale, and that allowed me to kind of scoot away and win that race. But I, I, I never forget that because it was one of the few times that you would be leading a race here on the last lap and be able to hold, hold off the other guys and win it. So uh, that was an exciting race. I ran my first race here, my first cup race in 1972. Came here in May of 1972, first time I'd ever been to this track. And I had my Mercury. And a lot of people say, so why did you, why did you decide to go to Talladega? Well, that's when we got the car done. We got it done the week before. We said, where's the next race? It's Talladega. But the other thing about that car was, I don't know if Grant remembers this or not, but uh, I think a guy named Rolf Stomlin had driven that car as a 69 Mercury here a couple of years before. Uh, Bill France Sr. had brought him over here. He was a road racer. And so that car, the, when I bought it, the last race it had been in was here. I, I ran a few other races and then came back here in May of 72 to run my first race. But... I mean, was anybody here in May of 72? Anybody? <laughs> Even close. Well, a couple of people were. And, and I don't know if you remember or not, but that was when Goodyear brought a new tire to Talladega. <clears throat> They'd been running a slick, which had worked beautifully, but they did a tire test with a bunch of the fast cars, and they brought a, a treaded tire to Talladega because that's what, what they ran everywhere else. <clears throat> and I'll never forget my crew chief, Jake Elder, <laughs> suitcase jake when i bought that car i i got 12 of the old uh goodyear slicks that they had run here with the car did they just threw them in and so that was the tires i had for my car and i'll never forget jake said well we're not going to win this race because we don't have the right tires i said well that's all i got and that's all i can afford and by the way i bought my tools and everything at western auto I had a little red toolbox came down here with a little box of tools a Mercury that was a pretty nice car, I thought, at the time, and a box of tools from Western Auto. So little did I know someday Western Auto would be my sponsor. But we got in that race, and this was amazing because Jake Elder was known to be somewhat of a uh, rule breaker, or, or, or he would figure out how to use the rules to his advantage. So we get in that race, and we start racing. And the first thing you know, I'm racing with James Hilton, and he won the race, by the way. First thing you know, Man, I just passed Richard Petty. Holy crap, I just passed Buddy Baker. My God, there goes poor. What is wrong with it? They were having tire trouble. They didn't have the old tires like I had. And James Hilton and I, who are a couple of independents, we had the old tires. So we're not having any trouble. And so these guys could run about 10 laps. They'd have tire trouble, and they'd have to go in, get, get tires or slow down or whatever. And here come Hilton and I. I, I probably could have won that race that day, but I blew up with about 20, 30, 40 laps. I don't remember what it was. But... That was my start. That was my introduction to Talladega. And uh, since 72, I've been here every year, and I have seen some of the most amazing things happen at this track that you can imagine. Bill France put the start-finish line, unlike any other racetrack, he had to put it way, way down there toward turn one. I can't tell you how many races have been lost from turn four all the way through the trouble down to that start-finish line. That was pretty brilliant on his part. So... Uh, it's been a great track for me. I've had 
I won four times here. I probably should have won four or five more, but it's one of my favorite tracks. You actually and, did win another race here. You just weren't credited it, right? Oh, you're talking about the one that Harry Gant won? 1977, you actually relief drove for Donnie Allison. Oh, I did that. I, I, Donnie I, was sick. Darrell got in the car and won the race, but the, the win goes to the driver who yeah. starts the race. Yeah, and I'll never forget that because he was driving for Haas Ellington. Haas was a character. It was a Hawaiian Tropic car. And when I won the race, I thought, well, this is cool. I won this race. I pull into Victory Circle in the car, and Donnie and everybody's already there, and they're celebrating. And I'm sitting in the car, and, and nobody comes over to see to help me get out of the car. <laughs> nobody comes over to ask me if I need anything. <laughs> so I finally I crawl out of the car, and I'm walking out of the pits, and I and I heard Haas say, "Well, so what are you going to do for a DW for winning that race?" He said, "I might buy him a Gatorade jacket," because <laughs> I was driving for Gatorade at the time. So, uh, uh, it, it, but it's just an incredible place. I love coming here. It's so much. We call Daytona and Talladega sister tracks, but they're really not. This place is a little bit bigger, a little bit wider, a little bit faster, and it's just a <clears throat> it's a it's a more fun place to race. You can get away with things here that you can imagine that you could ever get away with at Daytona. So it's a fun track. It's out here in the you know between Birmingham and Atlanta, right on the interstate, and the ins and outs now are pretty easy to do. You've got great uh, connection to the interstate, and uh, these guys have done an amazing job, Grant. Russell, all these guys are promoting this place. So people love the boulevard. Anybody ever been on the boulevard? <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Yeah, there you go. There's a guy back here that admits it. Yeah. Well, the, the boulevard is it's a wild and crazy. Uh, it's like going to Mardi Gras, if you've ever been to Mardi Gras. They line up to motorhomes, and they get out to karaoke, and, and uh, they put up all the lights, and they throw beads, and you. It's, it's a pretty wild and crazy place to go. And we usually do that on a Friday night because, you know, we have to get in bed early on a Saturday night. But if there's a concert, we might go to that. But anyway, enough. I, I mean, I, I just enjoy coming here. I love the tunnel. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of pe tracks have built tunnels. A lot of tracks have tunnels. But this is the tunnel that it's the end all, it's the be all end all of tunnels. Uh, finally, two of those big haulers that bring the cars to the track every week, well, actually, two of them can go through there at the same time, which is kind of unheard of uh, these days. So, great job, great planning, great foresight, and then all the things you're doing the infield. Um, one of the things that people tell me about they love coming here is the infield experience. They love coming here and camping. And uh, get I, this no 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 offense, but I had some people tell me so. Well, I want to go for the race. We go for the camping. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but it's part of it. It's part of the what makes it all work, you know. So it's a great place to come and, and bring your family and and see a, an incredible race. Well said, Captain Waltrip. Grant, what do you think? Daryl has meant not only this place but but NASCAR in general. That you'll have an information sheet that we passed out that will tell you. Everything Daryl Waltrip, uh, all of his statistics and NASCAR statistics here uh, about the four wins, about his international race of champions victory here also in 1984. But, Grant, you've known Daryl for a long time. Uh, what, what would you say about him? Well, he had a, obviously had a great driving career, but then he, he seamlessly moved into working for the TV, the TV folks, and he's one of the greatest commentators we've had out there as well. And so, you know, he had a, he had a spirit when he was trying to get himself, get him, build his name up. Uh, I think one time you, you uh, <coughs> said you'd meet the fans out behind Kmart one time. Yeah, but which it was, was a pretty bold out, move. It, it was taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's just been a great spokesman for the sport. And, I mean, to take his time to come down here and help us uh, with our transformation project. And we're very excited about having Gray Bar come on board to help us with that project and sponsor the transformation project for us for him to come down and help us get started with our our first race as, as part of that transformation is great for us as well so we think the world of him as well and I, I want to say something about our friends that have been building the tunnel for us we talked about them a little while ago it started raining when they cut the racetrack and for those of you that live in this part of Alabama y'all know it hadn't quit since for them to be on schedule now with what they've had to do. What's the amount of water you've pumped out of there, Lance? Uh, about 30 million gallons. Now. 30 million gallons have been <laughs> pumped out of that hole since we first started building it. So they have done awesome work 
and their own schedule, and I couldn't be proud of what they've done for us. Lance, won't you just give an update of where we are right now? I know we're, we're still tracking right on schedule, but mm -hmm. some of the folks were here last month. Right. Sort of what's the difference in what they'll see today and what well, they saw what last month? Well, what you saw last month when you got here, and some of the, the TV monitors are showing some of the updated on the construction progress, but we stacked out the roof of the tunnel. Uh, that was done the, like the day before you guys were here last time. And since that time, all the approach walls has been finished. Uh, that's the retaining walls going in and out of the tunnel. So those are in now. Um, one of the head walls is completed. They're working on the east head wall now. We've started backfilling the tunnel, which obviously that's, uh, I know all you guys are excited about that because if I don't backfill the tunnel, we can't pave the track back. So the backfill started and that'll be completed in the next probably two weeks. Uh, we can build the crash walls back and uh, the catch fence and all that and start paving the track back into March, 1st of April. Uh, to get ready for the race on the 20th. So you know, that's that's kind of where we are right now. Sweet, and Grant mentioned uh, Gray Bar. Gray Bar is now our presenting sponsor uh, for the transformation project. And they specialize in electrical, electrical communications and data networking. And uh, they've been involved with some of the other projects with International Speedway Corporation and some other racetracks. So from this point on, it will be referred to as Transformation <coughs> the Talladega Super Speedway Infield Project presented by Gray Bar. So uh, that's why you see the sign right here. We're extremely happy to have them on board. And a special shout out, too, to Papa Murphy's Pizza for providing us lunch today, too. Uh, those folks are extremely great to work with. Um, I'm just going to go and open it up to our question, to some questions here from our friends in the media, uh, to Daryl, to Grant, or to Lance. Any of the folks who have a question? Sheldon? Sheldon? Oh, I can't ask without a, I thought you wanted me to have a microphone. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat it. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. This is for Darrell. You talked about the, the races that you competed in, the style of racing that's here. But when you first saw this place and you drove up on it the first time, what do you recall? What was going through your mind? Well, the first time I saw this place, and, and I'd already been to Daytona, and, and i, I got to tell you, I, you may or may not know this, but in my opinion, Daytona is one of the most difficult tracks that we race on. It's fast, it's narrow, it's high bank, and there's not a lot of room for error there. When I saw this place, I said, now this, somebody put a lot of thought into this place because it's big, it's wide, and, and, and I don't even like to say this because it may be taken wrong, but this track's pretty easy compared to Daytona. Uh, I'm pretty sure with a little bit of time, a little bit of training, that most of you folks in here could go out and run a pretty fast lap around this racetrack. It reminds me, Daytona is like a two-lane road, and Talladega is like a, like a, like a four-lane highway. And, and you can get away with so much more here than you can at Daytona. That's why the racing is so exciting. That's why we see cars high, cars low, three wide, because you can do that here and feel pretty confident about not having an accident. Now, we have our share of accidents, don't get me wrong, you've seen a many, a many of them, but um, that was one thing I liked about this place from the first time I went out on it, was it was a lot easier than Daytona, and uh, a lot faster than Daytona, a little bit bigger, and the only thing I never could figure out at the time was, why in the world somebody put that start-finish line way down there? Now, you, you'll hear every driver that comes here, current, uh, drivers, past drivers, future drivers, and they will all comment about where that start finish line is because we've all seen races that literally have been won and lost from where the, it, it, you know, I won probably three or four more races if the start finish line had been in the middle of the trial, but I had to go on down there a little bit further. I got passed by Ron Bouchard there, got passed by a couple other people right at that line. So that's a game changer. But <clears throat> I think the thing that makes this track fun for me and for most of the fans is is really the experience of coming to Talladega, huge infield, huge camping areas outside. Uh, the people come here, they come here to have a good time and to see a race. And uh, they get they get to do both. So it's it's by far and away one of my favorite tracks. And I used to come here, we would race here on Sunday, but back in the day when I was broke and didn't have a lot of money, I'd get in my car after practice on Saturday afternoon and drive back to Nashville and race Saturday night in the races in Nashville and then drive back down here on Sunday to be here for the 500. If I didn't do that, I went over to Huntsville, a little track over in Huntsville, Alabama, and race there on a Thursday night. Or BIR, which is not far from here. So there are a lot of 
local short tracks that you could go and race at through the week and then come here and, and race on Sunday in the big show. And now they have the Talladega short track across the track over there. I was with Red Farmer two weeks ago. Red Farmer is 91 years old. He says he's 87. I don't know what difference it makes, but he says he's 87. But he's 91, I'm pretty sure. He was, I raced with him as a kid, and he was old then. <laughs> so, but he races over across the street over here at the track on a Friday night, I guess they have. So just a lot of fun things to do, and May's a great month to have this race. One more quick story. So I had had a little run-in with the Allisons. Imagine that. Um, at Talladega, Davey and I had kind of gotten together. And Davey took one of the, uh, it took a wild ride, and uh, I was really afraid that it hurt itself seriously. So the next week or two or three, I don't remember what it was, was Talladega in the fall. Well, I'm, a, I'm not a big football fan, but I'm, I'm a, more of a basketball fan. <clears throat> and back then you drove to a lot of the races. So on the way down here, we got to Birmingham, and from Birmingham on down here to the racetrack, I was passing people with a box of Tide and a roll of toilet paper on their, TV, on their, on their, on their radio antenna. And, and I didn't know that that was like, you know, football fans saying, roll Tide. <laughs> I thought they meant they were going to roll my Tide car is what I thought they meant. And I was getting pretty nervous <laughs> about coming to Talladega after what had happened with me and Davey at Ta Pocono a few weeks earlier. But someone explained to me, no, 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 no. That's a football thing. It doesn't have anything to do with racing. <laughs> but when I saw that box of Tide and that roll of toilet paper, I got real nervous. <laughs> Gwen. To the right. You've been coming since '72. Yes, ma'am. You've given us what the fans like. Yes, their favorite things. Tailgating and all. What are your favorite things about the track that you've seen since that time? The second question to you also is: If you have three tips that you want to share to up-and-coming drivers, women who may take over sooner yeah. or later, what would you give them? <clears throat> well, the thing that, I, again, the thing I liked about Talladega was uh, the atmosphere. Uh, you feel like you're at a special event. In the May race, or when you come back here in the fall, either one of those races, it, it always felt like a big deal. And back in my era, we had the, what we called the, the, uh, the big three, Daytona, uh, Charlotte, the 600 at Charlotte, and the Southern 500. That were your big three. And then when Winston got involved, they added Talladega into the mix. So anybody that could win three of those four races could win a million dollars. And so it only was, I think Bill Elliott did it once, I think, his own time. 1985, yeah. You went for it in 90, first year they had You it. went for it in 89. <clears throat> yeah. And so, but it should, it, there was just something about coming here that always felt like a big event. Uh, Bill France would be here, Junior, and we'd eat. Remember the little house that was out in front of the racetrack out here? Had the, we'd go out there, the private dining, and uh, have some great meals. The pork chops here are amazing. <laughs> Still have a Friday of race weekend. Yeah, you ever, yeah. I told you, you can get one. Yeah. <laughs> and there's one thing that I don't know where they get them from, but the catfish around here are the biggest catfish I've ever seen. We'll have huge. that on Saturday yeah. here in the Media Center, Daryl. You go down to An Anderson, Alabama, or over here at Pell City, and you can get some big catfish. I know that for a fact. So it's just a fun place to come to. A lot of places you kind of dread going there. You don't, you, maybe you don't look forward to it. Maybe you don't like the track, or maybe it's in a town you're not familiar with. or happy. But here, it's always been fun to come here. And I think, again, I think part of that mystique about this place are all those little tracks you could run through the week before you ran here on Sunday. And so it's just fun place to come to. Drivers for, that, to keep an eye on, uh, we're in a transition period. Uh, you know, a lot of the drivers are retiring. Uh, and, and so you gotta find a new guy to pull for. I'm a, I'm a big Eric, Gordon, or Eric Jones fan. Uh, he finished third at Daytona this past week. Uh, Chase Elliott, you know, right down the road in, in uh, Georgia. Uh, those are two young kids that got a great future. Ryan Blaney, I raced with his dad, Dave. I think you probably remember Dave. Um, uh, William Byron. Listen, William Byron is 21 years old, 
And I, and then t he'll be in this sport for the next 20 years probably, and you're going to hear a lot about William Byron. I think with Chad Canals as crew chief, uh, I think I expect big things out of William Byron. So that's just to it. There, there are a whole bunch of others. Kyle Larson's a young man. Joy Logano is a young man. Joy Logano is not even 30 yet. And, and Kyle Bush. Uh, you know, those are those are guys that have been here a little while, but they're still young men. They've still got 10, 15 years ahead of them. So uh, I know people say that they're not going to go to the race anymore because their favorite driver retired. But I think if you look around and you find some of these young men and you see something in them you like, if you latch on to them now, you're going to have somebody you can pull for for a long, long time. So we're in a transition. Older guys are going away. They've timed out. I'll be in that boat. Timed out. We've had our time. It's time to let somebody else <coughs> have the spotlight. And I, th I think we're real close to getting that transition behind us and then starting to grow and, and move forward. Questions? This isn't necessarily Talladega related, but since the new package goes into play this weekend, what are you looking for and what are some things that fans who might not understand the specifics yeah. but need to look for? Well, uh, uh, the thing that is uh, it's always interesting to me, these cars at, at Daytona last week were going 200 miles an hour. They, they would go into the third turn at 20-something, I don't know, but over 200 miles an hour. Did they look like they were going 200? On TV, I can't tell if a car is going 180 or if it's going 250. They, they, they kind of look the same. But when you slow the cars down, here at Talladega, we had to keep the cars under 200 miles an hour for years. They did not want the cars to exceed 200 miles an hour. We could be 199.9, but we couldn't be 2011. And so th that was kind of a magic number. And, and people say, why? Well, it's like the sound barrier. You can get up to it. But when you go through it, there's a big boom. And that's kind of how 200 miles an hour was for a long time. These cars now are, are, they drive well enough, they handle well enough, they have enough technology and they're safe enough that going over 200 miles an hour doesn't bother anybody anymore like it used to. So my point is, we're gonna slow the cars down. And, and that's gonna help. That one thing alone will help because when you're doing 200 miles an hour into a corner, you don't want anybody around you. You wanna be all by yourself because you're pretty sure you know what's going to happen, but sometimes there's that unknown and unexpected that catches you, catches you out and you get in trouble. I think you slow the cars down. Uh, I think the racing will be better. I think more people will be able to race side by side comfortably, and I think we'll see a better show. Listen, we're going to, we're going to Atlanta this week with a totally new package that we've never seen before. Saw a little bit of it last year at the All-Star Race in Charlotte. Remember that race? It was a pretty good race. Uh, I think... Uh, Kyle Busch or maybe Kevin Harvey won that race. Can't remember which one, but the cream rises to the top always. But we saw a hell of a race over there last last year at, uh, at, at in May at, at Charlotte. So there's a lot of people that will say they don't have any idea what's going to happen Sunday. But I think it's going to be better because they're going to slow the cars down a little bit. Not a lot. We're still going to qualify at over 180 miles an hour on a mile and a half racetrack. That's fast. But I think the guys are going to have more control over the cars. And then the crews are going to be challenged, the engineers and everybody, about the engines have a little less power. The aerodynamics will be a little bit different. And so they've got to work through all those things. We always feel like we're the guinea pig. And I mean, we Fox, because they make rule changes. We have to explain them. And they make rule changes, and we have to tell everybody what this is going to do and how it's going to affect and blah, blah, blah. And by the time we get our half the year done, they got it all ironed out, and NBC comes along and has a good time. But we are the guys that have to explain everything. And so uh, we'll go watch Atlanta. Then we'll go out to Vegas. That's a mile and a half. Then we'll go to Phoenix. That's a mile. Then we go to Fontana. That's a two-mile. And by the end of Fontana, we will have been to several, several different size tracks, and we'll be able to be more specific about what we've seen and what we think we'll see going down the road. You were right. Kevin Harvick won the All-Star race Harvick, last yeah. year. Questions? Darrell, the, the VIP area that's coming to this track later on this year where the, the fans can be in the garage area yeah. right up. As a former driver, when those races you come in where it didn't go exactly like <laughs> you wanted it to, what, yeah. what's your thoughts on, on that from a fan <clears throat> experience and getting the fans more engaged versus the driver that – Man, I really don't want to talk to anybody right now. Yeah, I, 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 I look, as a, I have to wear two hats, and I haven't learned how to wear my TV hat very well yet, so, and I've been doing it for 19 years. I, I, I know there are times 
when you want to be left alone. Uh, there are times when you are upset with your car, or you're upset with your crew, or sometime on the track, and, and this is an emotional sport. And when you're upset, uh, you, you kind of let people know about it, either on the radio talking to your team or your spotter, or maybe to your crew or whatever in the garage. So, but here's, here's what I think. I, I think we're at a kind of an experimental stage with our sport. Uh, we've had these hardcore folks like, like a lot of us in this room. Uh, we have kind of how we think the sport should be run and our expectations, but we have a lot of new fans that can't understand, why can't I go in the garage? Why can't I wear open-toed shoes in the garage? Why can't I wear shorts in the garage? Why can't I wear a tank top in the garage? And so we're, we're going through that whole transition from the core, the older fan, to the younger, more current, everyday, what we see, you know, everywhere else. So I think it's going to be interesting. I, think that, I don't think the teams would necessarily be in favor of that. But we all understand it, and, and we all want the sport to thrive and, and grow and be bigger and better than it's ever been before. So the teams will be willing to tolerate that as long as you don't get over in there and start working. I'll tell you a quick story. This is a good story, I'll tell you. I ain't got all day, but I'll tell you. But I might take all day. So we're at Martinsville, and they don't have a garage at Martinsville. So when you come to Martinsville, you park your car on pit road, and you work on your car on pit road. So on Sunday morning, all the fans that come to the racetrack, they're in your pit. They're, you're, oh, you're tuning on the car, and they're over there tuning on the car with you. You're working on your seat, and they're working on the seat with you. Earnhardt, bless his soul, he comes to me one Sunday morning. He says, let's go. I said, what's wrong? He said, we're going to go talk to France. We, got to have, we can't work on these cars, all these fans in here. We got to get something done about keeping these fans back away from the car so we can work on them. Come on, let's go. I said, all right, I'll go with you. So we go over to the big red truck, and we open the door, and the truck is at office where France is, and we open the door, and when we open the door, we go up a set of steps. Dale pushes me in and closes the door. <laughs> I looked around and said, where'd Earnhardt go? He left me there by myself, so I figured, well, I'm here. I might, and Francis, what do you need? And I said, we got to do something. I told him all what Dale and I have been talking about, and uh, he didn't, make, he didn't like that. He didn't want to hear that. He said, you better be glad they're here to watch you. And you better be glad they're here. That's what I'm telling you right now. So get your little butt on back out there and work on your car. You better be happy about that. But he wasn't happy about me being up in there. And I was up in there by myself without Earnhardt, which Earnhardt had a lot more clout than I did. But he pushed me in and left. So we get in the race. And, you know, you got to pit in your pit box. And you can't be out of the You can't get the nose over the line or anything like that. So we're in the race. We're running real good because I always run good at Martinsville. So we come in, we make a pit stop, and we go back out. And the next thing you know, Hammond comes on radio and says, you got to come back in. I said, for what? He said, they said you were over the line. I said, we were not over the line. He said, I know we're not over the line. I said, well, tell the inspector. He said, it didn't come from the inspector. It came from the tower. <laughs> That's where Bill was. So I sent him, I said, message received. <laughs> I never complained about people being in the garage anymore. <laughs> Questions? Frank? Hey, uh, you mentioned going back to the speed. On yes, sir. The front. I Last year, I believe it was, here at Talladega. Uh, you know, there were very, I think it was a truck race, I believe it was. There were hardly any crashes, you know, but speaking of the fans and their excitement, and, and uh, Bill, you could, you know, chime in on this too, but uh, the fans want to see a lot of excitement. Yeah. They want to see crashes but they don't want to see people get hurt right and just like last week we know when they had the big crash down at Daytona and uh, I didn't hear of anybody getting hurt seriously other than they're feeling the pride right but I just want your perspective on the fan excitement because when they you know in those last two or three laps that's when they hear you say boogie the boogie the boogie <laughs> And, you know, so I just want you to just elaborate on, yeah. you know, the technology for safety yeah. and then the speed that you can kind of get those two together yeah. so you can still keep the excitement 
and the safety. Yeah, well, I think a couple of things that uh, we saw at Daytona, for instance, we saw a lot of racing with the cars single file run around the top of the racetrack. And, and I don't want to see that, not, not from where I sit. I'm, a, I'm in the TV booth. I want to see some excitement. The drivers create the excitement. They really decide, because on Sunday, we were all saying we can't see any more racing like we've seen all week down here. Sunday's got to be more. It's a Daytona 500. You know, we can't have cars riding around the top all day long. Nobody's going to watch, and everybody's going to get upset if that's what we see. So the drivers decide, really and truly, they're the ones driving the cars. Am I going to run on the bottom? Am I going to run on the top? Am I going to follow this guy all day, or am I going to try to pass this guy all day? And so I, I think there's, cer cer there's kind of unintended consequences. You got to get to the end, and you don't want to wreck in the first lap of the race. You don't want to wreck halfway through the race. You want to, you know, try to get to the end if you possibly can. So, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, if if a race, if there's not a lot of accidents in a race, that's a boring race. If there's a lot of accidents, like we saw at Daytona on Sunday, that's an exciting race. But wrecks are exciting, and and nobody wants to see anybody get hurt, just like you said. And the cars are the safest cars they've ever been, and most likely. You're not going to get. You're not going to die in a car anymore. You might get hurt a little bit, shook up a little bit. So the cars are safer. Technology is greater, but it's really up to the drivers as to what kind of show we see. If they decide they want to follow each other, they'll follow each other. And we can't make them. There's no way we can make them not do that. But Jimmy France got up in a drivers' meeting at uh, Daytona Sunday and said, "I hope you guys realize we got to put on a show." And that's what Bill France Jr. was so good at is emphasizing on putting on the show. We might, if we're just going to follow each other around, we might as well paint all the cars one color and put more, their number on them and let them go race because that's part of what, what makes us who we are is that the different colored cars and the car numbers and the sponsors and the drivers and their personalities, those are all, it's a sum of all the parts. It's not any one thing, it's a sum of all those things that makes this sport great. And so when you see them riding around, don't get mad at NASCAR, get mad at the driver. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you trying to race? Why aren't you trying to pass that guy? Because that's really what we want to see. We want to see passing, we want to see close racing, side by side, best man wins. Well, I don't like, I'm, I hate it when somebody wrecks somebody on the last lap to win a race. The, the, in my era, the leader of the race got the most respect. You might rattle his cage, and you might bump him, and you might try to move him, but you didn't wreck him. And now it's come to almost standard operating procedure or normal practice. A guy's leading the race, he's going to get his butt spun out. And I don't like that. I wish it wasn't that way. But when the drivers control how the race goes, they decide how they're going to run the race, and then they decide if they want to make it exciting or not. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's I, kinda... I think it answered it extremely well. Yeah. One more question right here. Lance, I, I, before we go, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. I know we're, you know, we've been seeing arcs floating outside, and when we were here <laughs> last month, we were talking about the, the pump system that mm -hmm. put in to keep the new tunnel dry. Right. Uh, has that pump system been able to keep up with all this rain that we've had, and, and have you had to make any adjustments? No, it's uh, it's handling as it's designed to do. You know, with the the rain has been an issue for sure. You know, we've had a lot of rain and since we've started the project, but the groundwater is the biggest problem. The, you know, the rainwater we can handle that, but we haven't. We've got three pumps out there, and they're on float systems in that pump station. At the end of the day, they have new pumps in the station to handle all that water. But now they're keeping up with it. Um, it's actually. Sad to say, it's probably the driest place out on the track. Somebody was telling me that this morning right now is in that 35-foot deep tunnel that's out there that we're building. So it's it's working properly. Thank goodness. Yeah. With, with that said, uh, Darrell, we got a little gift for you. Um, you know, if you, if you look to the left over here, you can see this is a picture of Darrell's first race here back in 1972, <laughs> Mercury. number 95 Mercury. And so we've had him going around a couple places this morning with, with his hard hat on with the number 95 on it. But... We thought we'd give him something from way back in 72. So when we dug this place up, this is some of the asphalt from the race. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's got the picture. Here you go, Grant. Don't oh, man. You can see there's the picture of the Mercury. 
Look at that. <laughs> well, oh, it's oh, so you just oh. sort of tilt it. Coming it's apart. got some asphalt in there, and it's yeah. got a picture, that same picture over there to the right. Oh, that's cool, man. Just something that's a little different. I know Van would love to have that. Oh yeah. Up at the uh, at your place up in Concord. Yeah, well, we have a we have a little museum in Concord over by the racetrack there. Actually, it's in Harrisburg. It's on Husband Road. If you ever are up that way and you want to swing by, Van Collie, he's a he's the director there. He'll show you around. I got a lot of my cars. The Mercury is there. Um, got time for one more story? <laughs> hey, just as long as you stay and do some of the things that you know, we yeah. need to do. Well, you know? I gotta you. I, I'll, I'll call the pilot and tell him you're going to be a little late. So I bought that Mercury from Holman and Moody, and it was, it was a 69 Mercury when I bought it. And see, the life of a car, the, the, the ch as long as the chassis doesn't get just bent up or torn up or, or knocked out of line of where you can't fix it, you can put a body on a car, you can change it from a Chevy to a Ford to a Toyota. The chassis are all pretty much the same. Well, that Mercury, when I bought it, was a 69 Mercury. It was number 52. It was an orange car. You may somewhere in a program one day see number 52, an orange car. I think it was sponsored by Coca-Cola, and a guy named Ralph Stomlin drove the car. And uh, then when he, after this race, they took the car home, and they wanted to sell it. And so I bought that car from Home to Moody for $12,500. And that was a lot of money in 1970, 71. But, good news, I got a lot of spare parts. Car had an engine in it, brand new, had a spare engine, went with it, had some gears, had some tires, so they threw in a lot of stuff because they wanted to get rid of the car. So I bought that car for $12,500. And then I raced it a couple of times as a, Mer as a 69 Mercury. I wrecked it, and so I was over at Hutchinson Pagan. They built a lot of race cars back in the day. Dick Hutchinson, great driver in the, in the Cup Series at one time, uh, and his brother Ron. And, and so I was over at their shop working on my car, and I was going to fix it back as a 69 Mercury and run it in some of the Saturday races. And Hutch came out and said, why don't you make it into a 71 Cyclone, and you can run it in a cup race. I said, oh, man, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I'm ready for that or not. But anyway, that's what we decided to do. We turned into a 71 Mercury. And so we got the car all done, and then I brought it down here, and that was my, my first cup race. But... I, I have that car today. I have two cars in my shop that I have 25 cars in my shop. They're all a bunch of race cars that I've kept hung on to. But that's Alpha. That's my first car. And I have Omega, the Kmart car, which, by the way, a rain man hit it when he said, you know what. Uh, but that's my first car, and I have my last car. So I have Alpha and Omega, and I have a whole lot of cars in between. But I, for whatever reason, and I wrecked that car a bunch of times. For whatever reason, I, I always wanted to hang on to it, and I'm so glad I did, and I'm so glad I still have it. One more quick little tidbit about that car. That chassis was the chassis. That car started out as a 67 Fairlane that an IndyCar driver won the Daytona 500 in. Anybody know who that guy was? I know you do. Wait a minute. Give somebody else a chance. <laughs> Anybody know? You know he only got, he won six, 1967, he won the Daytona 500. His name was Mario, Mario Andretti. Mario. Mario Andretti. <laughs> that chassis that that body is on, that car I have, was the chassis that Mario won the Daytona 500 in. So I didn't know that until we were rebuilding the car into a 71 Mercury like it is now. Jake Elder was the crew chief on that car at that time. And he found a bunch of marks and some tags and some things on the car, and he said, this is Mario's car, and we didn't even know it. So a little more that's, history that's, to that car. That's pretty cool. Cool stuff, and we're so glad that your career started here at DW. What an illustrious career it was, and, and to start here at Talladega, we're, we're uh, thrilled with that. Thank you very much. Nice and, to be here. And DW, thank you for coming. No, we, it's we, fun. Really, I, we really appreciate I it. I heard about this tunnel. And so I wanted to come and see it firsthand, and it's as big and as amazing, and the, it's the greatest tunnel of any racetrack <laughs> I've ever been to. Well, speaking of the tunnel, that's what we're going to go do next. Uh, All right. We'll like Back to, to the tunnel. Yeah, we've got two uh, buses uh, like we had last time. So I'd like to let – there's only a limited number we can get on each bus.